Cool. Good morning. I'm Ariel Rivers, NACD's Pacific Region Representative, and I will facilitate this one-hour NACD Urban and Community Conservation Webinar on the Oklahoma Yard-by-Yard -Yard Community Resiliency Project. We'll record this webinar and post it on NACD's website, along with a PDF of the presentation for future access. Please share widely with your networks and anyone who may be interested in seeing this or previous presentations. You should be connected online to see the presentation, and you can access audio via your computer or by phone. Please check your confirmation email for additional details. All lines are muted except for the speakers. I'll open the chat area after the presentation so you can type in your questions and comments, and we'll address as many as we can. You may want to write down any questions to add to the chat box later. With the Adobe Connect system, Slide transitions will take a few seconds, so please do not worry that it is your computer or connection. Now, Ron Rohal will provide a few introductory comments. Ron is chair of NACD's Urban and Community Resource Policy Group, which is part of our Natural Resources Policy Committee. Ron? And thank you, Ariel, and I welcome all of you to the monthly Urban and Community Conservation Webinars offered by the National Association of Conservation Districts through the support of our sole sponsor, the Scotts Miracle Grow Company. These sessions are designed by NACD's Urban and Community Resource Policy Group, a subcommittee of district officials and partners charged with guiding the association's services and support for districts' work in developed and developing areas. Our goal through these webinars is to help districts share what they are doing nationwide and enable them to learn from each other and various agencies and organizations and we appreciate the support of the Scotts Miracle Grow Foundation for making them possible. I invite you to <coughs> excuse me. I invite you to let us know what you think about each webinar and what other topics you would like us to cover by contacting NACD staffer Ariel Rivers. And please tell our NACD leadership what type of assistance you would like from your national association for your work in urban and community conservation. And now I'll hand it over to Ariel for the introduction of our speaker. Thank you, Ron. Today we have one speaker from Oklahoma County Conservation District. Kevin Mink graduated from Vanderbilt University with his bachelor's degree in ecology in May 2014. He spent the next four years working for Trees Atlanta in the Forest Restoration Program, first as a team member, then as a program manager. In February of 2019, Kevin joined the team at Oklahoma County Conservation District. Since then, he is promoting the use of native wildflowers to create prairie-style gardens that provide habitat for endangered pollinators. He is also a master's student in landscape architecture at the University of Oklahoma, expecting to graduate May of 2022. Thank you for presenting today, Kevin, and I will now hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Ariel, and thank you all for joining in this morning. I'm excited to speak to you a little bit uh, about our Yard by Yard program. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Kevin Mink. I'm here in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Um, oh, man, that happened fast. Uh, I'm going to jump right in here um, and talk about our mission at the Conservation District. Uh, mission is to educate, empower, and assist citizens of Oklahoma County in protecting, managing, and conserving our renewable resources. Uh, so how do we do this? Typically, we host field days, we host workshops, large in-person events, we host natural resource days with schools, it's a common way for us to get information and education out to the community, but of course, boom, coronavirus happened this year and really threw our programming uh, into a mess. Couldn't gather with large groups, can't do volunteer projects, um, so we were largely based in doing either one-on-one -on -one consultations with people or uh, trying to find other ways to get the information out there. Um, so early on in the coronavirus uh, pandemic, when people were first quarantining at home and I started to work from home, I wanted to find a way 
to get information out uh, to folks about conservation, um, about becoming a good steward of the land uh, on their own home front. Uh, I knew that I was doing work in my yard, and so I assumed other people were out there doing this work as well. And so I started a series of webisodes where I was just tracking what I did with the compost uh, in my yard, and I talked about raised bed gardening and multiple different tactics you can you can take to um, you know improve your relation to the soil and improve soil health in your own yard. Um, so from there, I was like, man, if I'm doing this, I know other people are out there doing it. So how do I engage those people um, and get them involved with the conservation district. Um, I had thought about these major facets of at-home conservation that, that we've been promoting through the district even prior to the, the pandemic. Uh, native plant diversity, local water quality. Uh, we're big on, on increasing local food production. Um, so I wanted to see how I could take these big components of at-home conservation and develop it into something that the average citizen could, you know, take on and be recognized for. Um, so what I ended up doing is gathering a bunch of our regular partners. Um, and asking them what sorts of practices do they see as valuable, uh, you know, in the home garden or just in your home front yard. So uh, we consulted with the city of Oklahoma City, and we, we talked about irrigation um, and plants that are appropriate for reducing our uh, impact on local water resources. Uh, we talked to Oklahoma Forestry Services to find out what sorts of trees people should be seeing in their yard, what, what sorts of plants, maybe invasive plants, non-native plants, do we want to see people excluding from their yard. Um, we went to the extension offices and asked about compost uh, and soil health and, again, about, about plants. Um, and so all of these resources came together, gave us ideas of different practices uh, that we could put together um, and develop what became our yard-by-yard -yard checklist. Um, and it's relatively, uh, relatively easy. We broke it into four categories. Uh, which we'll go into a little bit deeper here. Um, and the main reason I'm showing you this PDF is because I wanted to illustrate that from all of those experts we consulted, we developed a pretty extensive um, resource list. So all of those blue lines there are uh, documents that relate to the practice that we want to see people accomplish. So we really wanted to provide people with the information on, on how to do this uh, and also a little bit of why uh, they should do this. So if, if, if they're looking to put in a vegetable garden or start composting, they could seek out these resources and, and kind of understand why um, it was part of our checklist. Uh, so, the first big thing that we decided on, and this, this kind of came across the board from our, um, from our experts, was that maintaining a pesticide-free yard was a really, really big uh, component of this uh, stewardship program. Uh, you know, we, we know that extended applications of pesticides in the yard uh, can cause lots of runoff into our local watershed. Uh, it disrupts 
are native pollinators a lot of times. Um, so we, right off the bat, wanted to make this a very big um, component of the, of the program, is, is maintaining a pesticide-free yard. And we kind of added the caveat of synthetic herbicides, pesticides, and free emergence. Um, we'll revisit this a little bit later because I'm sure a lot of you are wondering, well, like, how do you do that if you're trying to eliminate your lawn or, uh, or something like that? Um, but we wanted this component in there because it's very important to, to stop the excess application of these harmful chemicals. Um, so then the first category we developed uh, revolves around soil. Um, so some of these came from the Conservation Commission, some of these from extension um, practices involving using organic mulch, wood chips, or leaves um, in order to build organic matter and, and hold moisture. Um, On-site composting systems, capturing organic waste. Uh, so you can see a couple pictures there uh, of, of of folks who have done this. All of these photos that I am showing you are from folks who have joined our yard by yard program. So this is all straight straight from the certified yard. Um, we recommend increasing mowing height uh, because you can take up uh, more water, increase uh, soil root depth um, through having this this taller uh, vegetation. Um, and the big thing around this, around the composting and the mulch mowing is, is we're trying to divert waste from a landfill. There's so much yard waste ends up in, in a landfill that we wanted to find ways to encourage people to utilize the resources that they had on hand. Uh, we even have one participant um, I didn't include a photo of it, but she does, uh, she's just a single woman, lives in an apartment, so she does Bokashi composting, which is really impressive. We hadn't considered that as an option. Um, and so there's certainly realms where this will, uh, will change and expand as we go on. Um, Water uh, is a very big thing here in Oklahoma. I'm sure any of you who live in a city uh, and are like me get crazy when you drive around town and people are running their sprinklers while it's raining or they're doing it in the middle of the day or they're doing it so much that you're seeing excessive runoff into the street. So all of these practices, we, we kind of wanted to get at some of the problems we see with water quality or, or water quantity. Um, so we encourage the use of native plants. We encourage the use of heat and drought tolerant plants uh, that don't require any extra water. Uh, Oklahoma can be a pretty difficult environment. We really have wide ranging temperature swings, uh, the summer can be pretty hot and dry. So cutting down our water usage is super important. Um, and then the second thing was how do we capture some of this water? Um, so creating bioswales, which you see in the bottom right corner there, they have a little drainage uh, garden. Where they're trying to capture and infiltrate the water directly on site. Um, rather than allowing that to run off into the street and the local watershed. Uh, and then, of course, the other option to do this is to have a rain barrel. Um, <laughs> when it rains in Oklahoma, it tends to come all at once in full force. We don't, we don't often get those drawn-out days of, of rain, of prolonged rain. So it's really useful to be able to capture that water when it comes and utilize it for supplemental waterings around the gardens, particularly um, as we get into our next category, 
food where you almost always will need um, additional water to, to supplement. Um, so within our food category, uh, this can be as simple as having some containerized herbs, as you see in the top right corner, or having a full-out vegetable garden, as you see in our bottom photos there. Uh, but it also extends to fruit production. I mean, that upper, upper photo, uh, this family has a pear tree in their yard, and, and they love it. They have a couple young kids that, you know, are learning learning and watching this pear tree flower and produce fruit. So it's really important to integrate these components together. Um, thus far, we have not had any folks in an urban setting that have integrated chickens or goats into their, uh, into their yard, so I have no fun photos for you there, or honey beehives, but we know that those people are out there, and we know that that's a very big component and may also be valuable for us as we look to take this program into a more rural setting. And then the last, um, the last category is habitat. Um, and so one of the major things we focus on here in Oklahoma is uh, the monarch migratory pathway. We are right in the middle of it, so we highly encourage people to plant the path for pollinators by using native uh, host plants like milkweed for the monarchs. Uh, we encourage them to exclude non-native or invasive plants uh, from the landscape. We really encourage people to reduce the amount of lawn space that they that they have available because it it has very few ecosystem services associated with it. So we're looking to provide opportunities for uh, insects. Uh, bats, birds, to have a place living in conjunction with, with our yard. Some people even do this just by leaving out a nice big brush pile, as you see in that lower corner. Um, so just trying to find a way that we are not the only things in consideration here when we're creating our, our yard space. So there you go. Those are the four categories. Takes us back to our checklist. In order to get the certification, we require that you maintain a pesticide-free yard and that you practice five, you utilize five practices across three of our four categories. Um, so that's, that's relatively easy. Um, especially if you're working with native plants, because as you probably noticed, many of these categories fit together. So we, we separated them by soil, water, habitat. Um, there's a lot of overlap, which, which is a good thing that we want to draw people's attention to. And that's part of the reason we structured uh, the checklist in the way that, that we did um, so that folks you know, could kind of see some of those, those connections. Um, so in order to submit for certification, all you have to do is fill out this checklist. Uh, you have the option to submit a number of photos, which you've seen in the previous slides. Those are all photos submitted by our certified yard participants. Or uh, one of the more exciting things for us is we'll get people to submit videos. And I'm going to show you uh, two of those submissions right now just to give you an idea of, of kind of what we're going for. So hang tight. Sorry, y'all. I'm just trying to make this video play.
So this is the front of my house. I have. Kevin, I'm going to let it buffer for a second here while uh, uh, it does that, and that might speed up some of the, the process. Sure. I, I will let you press the play button when you think it's ready. So this is the front of my house. I have a flower bed out here that also has herbs in it, horseradish. I have two rain. Sorry, y'all. We're getting there. Barrels that are married. Ariel, is it best to keep going and double back, or will it? It, it won't load. Won't load that way. I tried that, and it seemed to restart the buffering on that. So uh, we'll give it a few seconds here. It seems to, to be speeding up on the buffering, and then we can hopefully get through a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'd be great. If we if we can if we can look through one, that would be that would be wonderful. So while this is buffering, Kevin, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, these videos and and what you appreciated about the submissions of them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the reasons we decided to do this video format uh, was because we have only been virtually educating people. We saw the videos as a way for us to engage with some of uh, engage with some of our community members, but also utilize them. Uh, as a resource. So many of these videos that we've taken, um, particularly the shorter ones, because I'm sure most of you are not watching super long uh, YouTube videos, but we'll take these submissions and we will uh, we'll put them out on, on social media through our Conservation District site, uh, through our Facebook pages, uh, and, and the big thing there was to show people just how easy it is for an individual to take on these, these sort of things. Um, and it gave us a way um, to give the community a voice versus it coming from us. Because I know, uh, I know that I become a broken record with these sorts of uh, initiatives and at a certain point, uh, folks, you know, they want, they want to know that there's somebody else out there doing that. This is what I do professionally, so it's certainly easier for me to talk about. But it's a lot, uh, it's a lot more helpful for folks who, um, you know, who aren't in this profession to see just an average citizen tackling these kinds of, of challenges and showing us how they do that um, in varied spaces. Um, you know, all of the yards are different. They're in different areas. Some are open. Some people have more trees. Some people have big lots, small lots. Um, so it's really a great way to illustrate, um, you know, the varied ways we can accomplish this kind of stewardship and conservation uh, at home. That's uh, really amazing, actually, and I love the community representation. It looks like we have uh, a little bit of it buffered now, so I'm going to go ahead and see if it, it'll play for us. 
Yeah, let's try it. And if it doesn't, we'll we'll just keep going. Those. Yeah. All right. That, that's that's all right, folks. We we will just keep keep going. It's not 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 moving along as quickly as I'd like, and I'd like to just keep plugging along along here. Um, but you heard kind of the beginning there. She's she she takes us on a tour, um, shows us her herb garden in the front, takes us around the back to take a look at her rain barrel. Um, she walks around the front again and talks about her native plants. Um, and then when we get into her backyard, she shows us um, her compost, her vegetable garden, some of her birdhouses, bee hotels, um, all of that sort of thing. If folks are interested in viewing some of these videos, I have some links at the end of the video or at the end of this presentation you'll be able to go and check some of them out on your own. So sorry about that, y'all. Internet can be a, uh, a fickle friend. All right, so uh, once they have submitted their, uh, their video or their photos uh, with, a, um, with the checklist, uh, we'll see a follow-up. Uh, and what's great about this is it's something that happens one-on-one. One on one. Um, you know, we're able to maintain uh, our distance. And uh, this is a really great opportunity to kind of help our, our members push the envelope. Uh, I don't think I have yet done a certification where they had no questions for me. So it's a great place to have some one-on-one -on -one educational uh, conversations about uh, conservation. Uh, and you eliminate some of that hesitancy uh, to ask questions that you get in big groups. So I have had these really wonderful interactions uh, with folks um, because most of them want to do more. You know, they, they love seeing this program, and so they're curious, how, how can they do more? Um, so it's really nice to have that one-on-one. -on -one. And that's really, that's really it. You know, the, the certification process is, is really not that difficult. Um, it's very easy to walk around with, uh, with these folks and see all of the things that they typically have already shown you in your video. But it's nice to kind of walk and talk with them uh, in person. Uh, so along with this certification, we have a, a couple of things that we give out. Obviously, we give out the yard by yard project package that goes uh, hopefully in the front of your yard. Our, our hope is that this is a big promotional tool within neighborhoods. If people see this, they scan the QR code, or they see yard by yard community resiliency project and they want to find out more how how can I how can I get involved what is this about uh, we also provide them with a little bit of native wildflower seed uh, because we want to encourage people to keep this process going um, so we give them enough to cover 250 square feet it's an all native seed mix um, Promotional stickers, of course, because who doesn't love stickers? Got to get, got to get your brand out there into the world. Um, and then the last two things that we think are going to become of increasing importance are community outreach postcards uh, and outreach cards for our state and local representation. And I'll walk you through those first. So the local representation outreach, we, we ask each certified yard member to send one of these cards to their city council person, uh, to their state senator, 
and to their state house representative. Um, and it's just a way to bring attention to the work that is being done. Um, it talks about resiliency and conservation. Um, and the fact that the, the type, this type of initiative uh, that this one person is doing, when done across the community, can have a, a tremendous impact. So we want to kind of keep this concept in the ears of our local representation um, so that, you know, as they get these cards, they can start to make a connection about what is going on locally um, with conservation and environmental issues. The community outreach cards are very similar uh, in that they, they have much of the same information, but the goal here is to get our participants to, you know, engage with their, with their neighbors, with their community members, um, because, as I mentioned before, we, we really want a lot of this uh, to be coming from the community. Uh, you know, we came up with a checklist, but, but we want these practices to be things that uh, the community is interested in. And so, you know, this is a way that we put the, we put the community in charge of doing outreach as opposed to us uh, being the ones, the professionals going in there to, to talk about it. Um, and from, from our certified yards, we have been able to really expand our our programming that had largely fallen by the wayside because of, of the pandemic. So uh, one of our members, Dr. Patrick Bell, uh, he heads up the Oklahoma Native Plant Society, has a really impressive yard setup. Um, he's eliminated all of his lawn space, and it, it's really a little – natural oasis, um, and he has taken on monarch rearing in his backyard as, as kind of a side project. So we took some time to revisit his yard and get him to give us a little, you know, educational webisode on, on outdoor monarch rearing with the hopes that, you know, other folks will see this and, and maybe want to take it on or at least at least have a better understanding of of how they could do that. Um, my personal favorite programming opportunity uh, have been our, our Wildflower Wednesday posts. Uh, since doing this, starting this program, uh, I've really had the opportunity to travel around the city and see all sorts of, uh, of projects um, that, that folks are you know, folks are getting getting into. Uh, sorry, I closed my page there. Um, yeah, so a lot of these are things that I don't have in my yard, I don't see regularly, so it's a great way to do a little bit of education again, help people identify some native wildflowers, highlight that we see them uh, in people's yards. Um, so it's really just another way that we can kind of take the yard by yard program and create additional educational opportunities while we're still not able um, to host in-person events. Um, so now is where I'm going to revisit some of the things that, that we've, we've talked about. Um, some, some people, you probably have heard me mention, eliminated their yard or eliminated their lawn. Um, we have often, I have often heard from my participants that code enforcement uh, is, is a big problem uh, because typically the types of practices we're discussing here don't fit within the perfectly manicured and proper lawn setting that most cities have allowed for in, in their codes. Um, and so people have been cited for having large, you know, too large a plant or too much debris in their yard. And so this gets back to our, our local outreach is 
sending information to local representation, highlighting that even though it goes against code, what's happening here is more valuable for the community than, uh, you know, my neighbor who gets uh, regular pre-emergent applications, pesticide sprays, you know, they're, they're costing the city money through those practices. So we're hoping that this sort of program may be, become a catalyst for local changes to our, so that people are, have an easier time taking on these sorts of, uh, of initiatives. Um, there's definitely room for more practices, potentially more categories. Um, you know, we've already had conversations about creating a wildlife water source, if that is something that should be included in the, in the practices underwater, or if that's something that is more appropriately put under habitat. Um, and I have no doubt we have practices that are overlooked. In fact, I bet you some of you right now are sitting here like, oh, why don't they do this? Or we should add that. And what's really cool is that as we, as we expand this program, it's going to change. It's going to take on new life in different regions. Even just in Oklahoma, I have no doubt that we will make some, some changes there. Um, that very first thing I said, uh, the problem of pesticides, uh, how and where do we draw the line? Um, because I've definitely been approached by individuals who want to participate in the program, but, you know, their, their perceived method of removing their lawn or treating their lawn is, is with, uh, with an herbicide. Um, to be honest, we have not had many issues in this realm, and so it hasn't been a big point of contention. Largely, uh, participants have taken, mm, taken the lack of pesticides more from a moral standpoint. Uh, you notice one of, a couple of the photos had families with kids, they said they don't apply any pesticides or chemicals simply because their children play in the yard. And so, you know, it's a non-starter for them. They're not going to apply anything. Um, but I'm sure in the future, you know, we'll have to address this in a more cohesive manner. Um, and then the big question is, can this program be adapted to a national level? Um, uh, the practices that we have, we specifically left broad um, because native plants are different from, from state to state. So maybe there's a realm where the, the categories are the same, the practices are the same, but the resources for people are different, right? Instead of going to my extension office, they're going to, you know, uh, your own local, local extension office. So the possibility to scale this program up is particularly interesting to us. Um, so future things that are coming with this program, we launched this in July of uh, this year in Oklahoma County. Tulsa County, which is the second most populous county in Oklahoma, uh, launched on August 1st. Um, we have had, we had great initial reception, um, you know, and we have, have gotten more than 30 yards, uh, in, you know, between the two counties certified, uh, obviously going into fall, it's been slowing down quite a bit, uh, but we're looking to take this statewide, uh, come the spring. So we'll be doing online and in-person trainings for other conservation districts uh, in Oklahoma. Um, we think there's a tremendous opportunity for research here, especially as we scale up to the neighborhood level um, and potentially the watershed level where we can start to track the impacts of this. Um, you know, when pesticides aren't running off and people have been reducing them, there's going to be an impact to our local watershed. Um, 
And so there's definite opportunities um, for valuable research to, to come out in, uh, in, in this area with the use of community members. Um, and that's, that's actually, this should have been switched, is the community level intervention uh, is something we've talked about all along, is how can, we, how can we take an individual who has this motivation to get certified and use that to catalyze the rest of the neighborhood to make a change. Um, and in fact, we're actually partnering with the Association of Central Oklahoma Governments um, to promote this program in a number of their uh, in a number of their neighborhoods come come the spring. So that will be really exciting to see if we can get some larger neighborhood level uh, interventions uh, to happen, so that we get this. You know, we have a, a wider effect, right? It's it's the whole idea is that no individual yard can make the change themselves. But if we take it yard by yard, those cumulative impacts will be noticeable and they will be measurable. Um, so we, you know, that's that's kind of where we're we're going with uh, with this whole thought. Um, so there you go, y'all. I'm 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 a little early here. I think I probably would have rambled about my videos a little more. But that's all I have for you. Thank you so much for for joining in. Um, the photo you're looking at right there, that's our yard sign. Um, you can actually scan that QR code if you want, and it'll take you right to our website, um, okconservation.org slash yard by yard. Um, if you check that website out, you will find, um, you'll find videos, you'll find uh, links to our YouTube channel. Uh, so that you can view, hopefully take the time to view some of the submissions we've received and also some of the other educational efforts that we're putting out there uh, in conjunction with this program. Uh, and so I think I'll leave it there. And Ariel, if you want to open it up for questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll now take questions for Kevin and comments in the remaining time available. The chat area is open on the left side of your screen. I'll read each question aloud to capture them in the recording. And thank you again to Kevin for presenting today. Kevin, I'm curious about, uh, you had mentioned that one, one opportunity that you see for the future of this program is is potentially capturing some of the, the benefits via research questions. Is there one research question in particular that if you had time you would you would immediately start looking at? Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, the answer to that is yes. But once we, we really need to reach a community level intervention for that to be feasible. Um, and what I am thinking personally would be interesting is, is to track, uh, track changes in water quality over time. Um, you know, as the particular neighborhood moves away from using synthetic herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers, uh, which have a huge tendency to run off in big storm events, you know, if we start to eliminate those, we should be able to measure that, uh, that change. Um, but like I said, that kind of has to happen, kind of has to be happening at a community level um, and more so on a watershed level to be, uh, you know, to be feasible. Absolutely. Uh, so thank you for that. We have two questions that are related to funding uh, of the, the program. One is, are the material, signs, stickers, seeds, et cetera, being paid for through a grant or uh, by partner agencies, et cetera? And then uh, generally, how is the project funded? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Great question. Should have, should have included this. So we, we received a grant to basically get the project off the ground. 
um, you know, there's a local local community organization that gives out grants. So we got a kind of a small change grant to buy a number of signs and seed and stickers to kind of get us started. Um, our hope for the future as we go statewide is that our our um, our state our state association of conservation districts is talking about providing basically mini grants for districts who are interested in taking on this uh, this project because they've they've seen it as super valuable and and pretty successful. Um, so the hope is that the state association is essentially going to subsidize the districts to get the, the program started. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so two questions related to the checklist. First, is it possible to access that online, or, or would it be uh, possible to send it to the attendees? And then second, are you planning a checklist 2.0, and what, what changes do you have in mind? Yeah, okay, cool, great, great questions. Um, so as far as accessing the checklist, um, I encourage you guys to go to okconservation.org slash yard by yard. Um, and there is, if you scroll down on that first page, there's a link uh, that takes you to the packet um, with, with the checklist on it. But I can also, uh, I can also make it uh, available, Ariel. I can share it with you if you want to share it with participants. The after. conference is now being recorded. Um, and then the question about checklist 2.0. Uh, yes, Dan, that is definitely in the works. We have, since launching, kind of kept a side short list of additional practices that, that we might add in. I think the most prominent one we've, we've discussed and gone back and forth on is, you know, providing a, a water source. Um, you know, the, the, the back and forth has been if providing a standing water source is valuable enough, despite the fact that it is maybe a breeding ground for mosquitoes, you know, so some challenges like that, but yes, we'll definitely do upgrades to the checklist as we move on. Excellent, thank you. Uh, in regards to the wildfire wildflower Wednesday post, uh, who does those and who receives them? So uh, typically, I am the one that's that's doing doing the post um, because. In Oklahoma County, I'm the one who's, you know, out certifying the yards. So I am the one who captures the pictures. And then I just post them via our social media channels. We have uh, a decent following on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, and so that's, that's the main place that, that we put it out. And fortunately, we have some great uh, partners like Okies for Monarchs and OSU Extension who tends to reshare our information so that it, it gets out a little uh, further. Excellent. Um, and we have another question about uh, the program locally. So was it easy to move from, the, from a local program to a statewide program? And do you have an estimated cost for staff time and materials for new districts who might participate? Um, well, I would love to answer that question, but you'll have to ask me this time next year. We're we're still we're still kind of developing, uh, you know, developing that thinking about, especially in the face of the pandemic, how are we going to inform and train our other districts to implement this, um, you know statewide we're we're still kind of working on how we're going to do the statewide launch and make sure that we get um you know get everybody up to speed on how the how the program works um so i'll have to revisit that <laughs> absolutely uh 
And one uh, question regarding the certification, is a yard visit a requirement to get certified? No, certainly not. Um, you know, we recognize that this is a difficult time and people have to protect themselves in the best way that they see fit. Um, that's part of the reason we encourage people to submit a video specifically because if we're not going to be able to go out and kind of visit in person and confirm that this is happening, the video is really the best way for us to, you know, ensure that they are doing what they say they're doing. Though I don't really know why anyone would apply for this program if they, you know, like, I don't know what you gain from fooling us in this, but uh, you kind of get, get my meaning here is it's not requirement. Definitely helpful, though, because almost every homeowner I've, I've visited has questions. You know, what else can I do? How do I do this? So it's nice to kind of do that in, in person. Absolutely. So um, it looks like Dan is typing one additional question. Uh, and um, while we wait for that, uh, everyone has very positive uh, comments about the program and the presentation. So thank you again, Kevin, for sharing that. And you do have plenty of information on your uh, website and Instagram as well, correct? Yes, yes, absolutely. I, I, I highly encourage, uh, you know, as I said, you can, you can visit the okconservation.org slash yard by yard. Um, you can also check out our, the district Facebook page, uh, which is just facebook.com slash OK County Conservation District. Um, so those are, you know, great places to follow us, see what we're up to. Obviously, things are kind of winding down with the program at this point in the year. It's getting harder and harder to do Wildflower Wednesdays because there are just aren't really anything blooming at this time of year uh, in Oklahoma. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of those are our big channels uh, for information. I did want to know. I saw Victoria made a comment about local officials and and code enforcement, and I 100% agree with you. Uh, we specifically involved the city in the development of the checklist, and uh, I have a decent relationship with the sustainability manager uh, in the city who was all for this. I even told him that some of these things would be would likely be against current code enforcement, um, and he was like, actually, that's good, please do that, because we need to change the narrative. Um, you know, so we're hoping that in the future, we can kind of use this to catalyze some, some change so that people aren't being cited for doing what we perceive as the right thing. Excellent. Thank you for that comment. And uh, Dan's question was, do you have suburban or rural clients who have, say, five or ten acres of property but want to certify a yard, and how would you interact with them? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, Dan. That, that's something that fits into our, our statewide wow. launch um, because, as I mentioned, Oklahoma and Tulsa counties are the most populous in Oklahoma, and much of the rest of Oklahoma is more rural. So how, how do we adapt these to work on a, on a larger scale? Um, you know, I don't honestly know where we draw the line as far as, you know, agricultural land. You know, if somebody's doing something good in their yard, but they are still needing to do herbicide applications, uh, you know, based on their agricultural practices, I'm not quite sure how we draw that line. Um, but as far as, you know, the general individual, if they have five or ten acres, they're not farming or anything like that, we're, we're definitely open to certifying larger tracts of land as long as they fit within uh, – you know, as long as they fit within the categories and the practices that, uh, you know, that we've outlaid. 
I don't know if that would help. <laughs> so we're just about out of time. So again, I want to encourage anyone that has any additional questions to reach out to Kevin and check out the, the resources that they have online. And uh, before we close, just a few reminders. Remember to look at NACB's Urban and Community Conservation webpage, which features information on urban projects, backyard conservation, and links to past webinars. And make sure to sign up for our publications if you have not already to receive all the latest news on conservation district and partner activities. Remember to also register for next month's webinar, which will kind of touch on a similar theme regarding outreach. Uh, it will highlight Thurston Conservation District partnership with Bounty for Families and their work on growing community flexibility, adaptability, and collaboration during COVID-19, which celebrates urban individuals, uh, again, who adopt various practices. And so thank you all again, and thank you, Kevin, for presenting today. And I look forward to seeing all of you next month. Thank you.